Society tends to treat people with disabilities a little bit differently, and unfortunately this is also true in the world of martial arts, where any sort of hindrance or impairment can come across as uh, scrutinized or come with some preconceived notions. Today we have a very special guest who lost his eyesight at the age of 15, and he's not only an established martial artist, but he lives his life doing all sorts of adventures. And he's here with us today to break a lot of these misconceptions and share a perspective with us and a very, very important lesson that we can all learn and enhance our own lives with, whether we have any impairment or not. It is with great pleasure that today we introduce Sensei Joshua Loya. So I'd like to get back to the topic of how you lost your sight, but the first thing I want to talk about too is what are some misconceptions that people might have about not having vision and training in the martial arts? That we're all daredevil. Uh, I hate to break it to you. It's not a documentary. <laughs> I mean, there is something to it, right? Like it, um, in terms of adjusting to our senses and things like that. But a lot of times people see one blind person or one person with a visual impairment and they think that's representative of everyone. And the thing is, is just as we're all individuals, everybody does blind a little differently. So you might say, for instance, have me, you know, I lost my eyesight when I was a teenager. I mean, you might have somebody who's coming into the dojo who's been blind their whole life. And so that's very different from me. So like I had a, a student once who was also blind, but he'd been blind his whole life. And I was teaching him how to uh, draw a sword. And then we had these these sheathable bokens in our dojo. And so it was perfectly safe for both he and I to touch the blade. And, you know, me, before I lost my eyesight, I used to watch all these martial arts movies, Bruce Lee and, you know, Karate Kid and all that stuff. And so I had a reference point, even if I didn't actually know what a lot of this stuff exactly worked, you know, how, how it went. I had a frame of reference. He didn't have a frame of reference. Technically, he was doing exactly what I was asking him to do, but it wasn't what I wanted him to do. And so, you know, just a recognition that everybody does blind a little different. Um, another one, man, this bugs me. <laughs> Why'd you ask? I, I get the utility of this, but um, I hate it when somebody grabs my shirt and pulls me by it. Now, sometimes if you're doing drills and you're, say, you're, you're shrimping across the mat in jujitsu and you need to get out of the way because somebody else is coming through, I can see the importance and, you know, the, the safety trumps dignity and respect. Um, but it feels icky to me personally, and I suspect it probably would other people. The, if you're going to guide somebody who's blind, letting them grab a hold of you or asking consent, if there's not a, an, an urgency thing, right? If there's, if you don't have time to ask consent and somebody's going to get hit with like a, like, like a stray, like I I don't know, tonfa that they lost because they were doing a form wrong or something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, grab. Sure. Um, but if there's room ask, and if you don't know how to do something, ask more than just assume, Oh, I, I, I know. Um, and, you know, and you'll learn the more time you spend with someone and the more time you have interaction with um, people who have a visual impairment. I say that I'm blind. Some people get into this whole person first language thing. I just say I'm blind, but um, either way, if you don't know, just ask. Oh, uh, what's just for context, what arts do you practice in? So I have um, a background primarily in guardian Kempo, um, which has some connections to Karho Kempo and Kaju Kempo. Um, I also have a background in uh, Tekyo Jitsu, which has, uh, origins in both Tong Sudo and Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Our, the guy who started that program is a uh, you know significant ranked black belt within Tong Sudo and also a Gracie Jiu Jitsu black belt. Um, and then beyond that, I've gone on to absolutely fall in love with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It's actually the uh, this here is a, it's the shirt from the Jiu Jitsu gym where I train in Del Mar. Uh, Surf Fight Jiu Jitsu. Shout out Uncle Joel and Majid. Um, and then I've done a little bit of Judo. Judo is really hard on the body. Uh, so I, I, I'd like back to it a little bit. I threw it my back uh, a little while ago. So I building up that armor because if you don't have your Kemi exactly perfectly, you can get slammed pretty hard. Um, so yeah, I would say Kempo, Karate, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a little bit of Judo. And um, I've, I've gotten into uh, a little bit of uh, Jeet Kune Do and, and some other Kung Fu training as well, though I don't have any uh, rank in, a, in a, any of it <laughs> at this particular That's... juncture. A pretty significant mix. I mean, that's that's just as much. It just means that I've people. just been obsessed. You know, like I like for me, like I love the esoteric. You know, I'm learning some Tai Chi right now, uh, but I also am learning uh, some of um, John Hackelman's uh, program, uh, his Hawaiian Kempo program, because I just I want to keep learning and up leveling my uh, ability as a martial artist. 
Fantastic. Now, when it comes to like the judo and the Brazilian jiu jitsu, and, and arts like that, when you're it's it's all about touch and initiation and feeling emotion. Mm-hmm. That sense of touch has to be greatly important. And I mean, how does that impact your your training at all? It's everything, right? If um, because both relevant to training, also for competition, and also, you know, when I'm thinking about self defense concerns, right? If I go into a a loud bar or club and or a a loud uh, event center um it's going to be loud it's going to be hard you know as much as um i'm not daredevil uh i use my hearing somewhat but there are especially when i'm tired when i'm uh, my heart's pumping and you know maybe i'm breathing hard and and all of that um my sense of of hearing is is only so beneficial and so that developing that sense of touch that the kinesthetic touch sense of of you know where i i've reached out and i've maybe i've i've hit with a jab if we're striking now i have a point of contact if somebody's grabbed me now i have a point of contact i can follow that up and the more i build that sensitivity um the more my lack of eyesight isn't a factor now if somebody wants to do like a sneak attack you know there's a, a period of time where people are doing like a, a knockout game uh, where they just run up and, and just hit people in you know, the side of the face. And, you know, that's not, there's not a whole lot I can do about that. But once there is physical contact, um, that's my in. And so for me, one of the biggest things I would encourage any uh, person who wants to be able to fight better without having to rely on their eyesight, develop that sense of touch. And, and you know, whether it's, it's push hands, you know, from some of the Chinese martial arts, whether it's um, playing open guard a lot, right? Like, open guard um is a lot like chisa with your feet and so developing that that kinesthetic sense is going to be absolutely vital regardless of what your goals are uh for martial arts if you have any lack of uh, eyesight as compared with most people i think and we talked about this in our pre-conversation um because there's a big difference between like you talk about the arts where you're already making contact and just grappling Mm -hmm. but when it comes to something that's a striking art boxing or, or karate there is that disconnect when you're not making that contact and you had mentioned about using um using your jab as an antenna could you could you talk mm-hmm. about how, how your little strategy with that yeah i mean it, it depends on the type of engagement but for sure like if i'm um i don't have any any like real deep training in, in muay thai but i've had a chance to do a little bit of muay thai I, I, I learned this from uh uh tiffany the time bond van Seist. Like it was so crazy i got a chance to do uh like Muay Thai training with like the glory kickboxing world champion, which is nuts. Um, but she would, she actually kind of helped me work on that a little bit um, where, you know, you, you kind of keep your hands moving. So you kind of give somebody a little bit of a barrier. They can't just walk right through it. Um, but once I have the connection, I'm like, oh, okay. I can kind of throw it out there a little bit because it's, it's, it's one of those punches, one of those types of things that if you can kind of toss it out and it's, you're not over committing, you're not breaking your structure, um, you can toss it out from different angles and from different points while still keeping a good guard. And even, you know, so I'm going by my, my, my sense of, of sound, my, whatever pressure I feel on the mat, right? If you're on a jiu-jitsu mat, if you're, even if you're doing striking class, sometimes you can feel the pressure, the way the ground changes. And so I can have a good gauge, but once I have that connection, and this is why I talk about the importance of gaining that sensitivity, you know, I, I may only have you know, a little bit of connection and I'm wearing, you know, 12 ounce gloves or 16 ounce gloves or whatever it is I'm I'm doing, you know, I, that's my point of connection. Now, if I can learn all the things that can be learned from that point of connection, then I'm not just throwing Hail Mary kicks, which is a really dangerous thing to do anyway. And I'm not perfect at it. Like there are times where I've totally gotten my ass kicked, um, you know, but at the same time, there are times when I'm able to do something and, and really I, I don't do martial arts because I'm good at fighting. I think I'm all right. You know, a few a few instructors seem to think so. You know, get a few black belts under your belt or whatever. But um, and by the way, I just want to be clear: I'm not a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Still, only a purple belt. I, I have a few black belts. Don't want to take any credit there. That's not earned. Um, but martial arts is about. I think one of the values of martial arts is the intentional struggle, right? I love um, judo because it's really hard. I like things that are difficult that um, I can throw myself into. It, you know, I, I, I think that if somebody wants to do, get into martial arts because they think it's going to be easy, well, 
you know, Rob from McDojo Life has a whole bunch of people he can recommend who will teach you. <laughs> and I like that you're talking about on, on, on challenges and making things that are hard or you like accepting these challenges. So yep. kind of a two-part question about that mm-hmm. to, follow, to follow that up with is the first part is you mentioned about losing your sight when you were 15. Um, can you share with us a little bit about what happened and, and, and how you lost your vision? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I was born with folds down the center of my retina, right in my macula, if, if anybody knows the anatomy of the eye. Um, essentially, right down the focal point where I would, your, your, your retina is kind of like the film if your eye is a camera. And my right retina was detached when I was about two or three. That fold there makes me more susceptible to retinal detachments and injuries. They found out too late to do anything about it but they were able to keep the vision in my left eye. We were kind of pay attention to that for a while. And um, 2300 was what I was technically, you know, the actual numbers if I wore glasses. So still super nearsighted growing up. Uh, I was exempt from phys ed. So, you know, I karate, j- judo, all that stuff was completely out of the question. Uh, at least I was supposed to be. Uh, my friend showed me stuff. But in any case... Fast forward to my sophomore year of high school, I had had quite a number of eye surgeries already. So no running, uh, no lifting weights, no swimming because I might hit my head in the pool. Um, They didn't even want me straining, lifting just normal everyday objects, you know, just real, real fragile. And so what do I do? (laughs) I grab a pair of nunchucks and uh, crank up Pantera's Far Beyond Driven album as loud as it would possibly go and promptly hit myself in my good eye because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, last thing I saw was, uh, the vague outline of the telephone. Cause I was trying to call the, the ambulance. I was home alone at the time. And, uh, it was, don't get me wrong. It was scary as, as scary gets. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there was, I tried a couple more surgeries after that and okay, well this next one, you can keep going. This next one's going to have about a 50, 50 chance of working. Uh, you'll see less than you did before. Cause by this time I was still blind as a result of the, the nunchucks, and they said, well, yeah, and you'll have to be even more careful than you were before. And I was kind of going, wait, this is exactly the opposite of the type of life I want to have. Like, I, even when I was a kid, before I, when I was still exempt from phys ed, you know, like I loved, like I, I loved watching X Games on, on TV. And I, I used to like, I used to like watching the surfers and, and, and all the and skaters and everything. And I couldn't do any of it. So when I lost my eyesight, um, then I was able to, do more. And, and I essentially, I I told the doctors, you know, I appreciate this. Um, I I think I'm going to go ahead and and call it, you know, my mother is also blind and and she was blind before I was ever born. And she raised me mostly herself with the exception of a few years here or there. And I saw the quality of life she had. And I was like, okay, well, life is going to suck, but, um, you know, this part's going to suck, but being able to not have to worry about losing it, I think that's going to be give me a better quality of life. And that's what I went with. And, you know, again, it, it wasn't easy, still isn't easy after, you know, what, 27 plus years now. Um, but, oh my God, I, 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 I don't know how well I would have been able to manage if I had to still be this un, unwilling indoor kid. Six months after I lost my eyesight, I was water skiing and, and trying stuff. And I was able to actually eventually get into martial arts and learn how to use nunchucks. It was a bad thing, but a lot of really good things came as a result of me losing my eyesight and, and kind of having to be careful was no longer something I had to deal with. And, and that was at least a partial silver lining if there is one. So that's what I really find fascinating is it's not just the martial arts that you do, but you're also, you know, really into surfing and you also use the term professional adventurer. So actually losing your vision in a way opened up your opened up the door to freedom to these activities how yeah. did you once you made that decision how did you actually approach to approach learning surfing and and being adventure like how did you step outside that shell when i was a kid i struggled with fear a lot like i had nightmares all the time and I, you know I, maybe it was because i couldn't see far off into the distance and things would surprise me or whatever um i quit my job in 2016 i was a computer trainer and I had an opportunity to train ju- judo with Justin Flores, who's, um, you know, people who know judo know Justin Flores, his brother Jacob, their father, um, big judo family. Justin worked a lot with Ronda Rousey to help her apply her uh, her judo to her MMA. And I was like, you know what? I got a chance. I got a, had a free ride at this gym where he was teaching. I was like, well, let me go do this. Let me take a crack at this whole, like, Paralympic judo thing. Because, you know, 
Tokyo was a few years down the road. I thought maybe my Kempo training could really help. I, I decided to do that. And I was like, well, I can't really uh, do judo all the time. I can't do jujitsu all the time. Let me, let me find something. And I, there was a local surf event that was kind of handholdy, um, but especially designed for people who are blind like myself. Um, and I liked it and I wanted to do more of it. And, but I didn't really know how to do it, you know, for real. And as far as not having somebody help me paddle and all the, the different things. And when I started getting into some of the more challenging surfing, not, not like big, crazy hundred foot waves, like Laird Hamilton or anything like that, but just where it was of consequence, you know, be honest, I was afraid of the ocean. I was afraid of the ocean and I realized that I didn't want to be bound by my fear. It's the same reason I did judo is afraid of, of being thrown and, and hitting the ground and not knowing when it was coming. And I let my fear inform the, the path I ran to, to develop my courage because, you know, courage isn't the absence of fear. I don't know what the actual origin of the quote is, but something like courage isn't the absence of fear. It's being afraid and doing it anyway. And I, I resolved and have, dug in even deeper as the years have gone on that my fear is what I run to um, with, you know, the caveat of still being smart. I'm not going to run in front of a truck because I am afraid I'm going to get hit and I'm right. But when it comes to I'm afraid of the ocean, well, let me find a way to make peace with the ocean. And I, I, I got to tell you, uh, I never have a bad day surfing. For me, surfing is forced meditation. Right. You're basically going to either live in the now, right, in this present moment, or you're going to fall off your board and you're going to have to hold your breath. And and if I'm thinking about the wave that I caught you know, 20 minutes ago, I'm not thinking about the wave that I'm on now. And if I'm not thinking about the wave I'm on now, I'm not going to ride that. And if I'm thinking about all these other things, you know, the only way to do it right is to focus on here and now. And I think that that is a mindset um, experiencing, you know, the thing they call a flow state, the more you can tap into that, I think that will help um, as we grow and expand and challenge ourselves, whether it's martial arts or anything else, finding a way to tap into that is, is really key. And and for me, that, that fear was the initial spark and then realizing I didn't want to be bound by that fear. Now, now, as you started to tackle on these sports and these activities, uh, a lot of people have, you know, th they, they've got these preconceptions about, oh, well, if you don't have your vision and, of course, your hearing mm -hmm. it gets better and all that. And you've already kind of explained some of the challenges with that. But what I find interesting is there's actually a lot more than just five senses to the body. There's there's a whole bunch of subcategories. And uh, the two I'd like to ask you about is one, the sense of balance and mm -hmm. two, the sense of the human body in space or proprioception. Did you have any struggle with those once you lost your vision completely, or did you find those actually became more attuned, or, or how did that work out? I, I I had a little bit of invulnerability mindset for like at least especially the first six months to a year. Um, that even though I I struggled, I figured okay, eventually I'll figure out how to do it. Eventually I'll figure out how to be Daredevil. You know, not really, but with the teenage mind. You know, I was a big fan of the comics when I was younger, so of course. Um, but I absolutely found a big difficulty in be knowing where I was, being able to walk a straight line even. I, I once overheard before I got into martial arts more consistently, so I only dabbled until I was in my mid-20s really, um, I had uh, I overheard some people going, oh, there it goes, walk by Braille, because I couldn't walk down the, the sidewalk straight. And then eventually, once I get into martial arts more consistently, I... Um, you know, a lot of people poo-poo kata, but one of the things I love about kata is that it helped me to understand my relationship to myself, my relationship to the room that I was in, to the space that I was in, without having to worry about the obstacles. So I didn't have to worry about somebody um, punching me while I was learning, say, for instance, to do a low block and a, and a reverse punch, right? Or, or whatever the particular combination from the, even the most basic katas, learning how to like if you go into the H forms, the I forms, depending on how you want to call them, right? You have your your 90 degree turns, your 180 degree turns, maybe even your 270 degree turns. That in and of itself is a real challenge. So that helps my body's awareness and space. And then absolutely, the ba pro, uh, both proprioception and balance, um, I don't have the benefit of looking at a spot in front of me as a cheat. You know, what are the, what's one of the things they say when you're first learning how to balance, especially you're doing 
um, multiple kicks on one single leg, maybe they might say, oh, look at that spot over there. Use that to help you. Well, sorry, that doesn't work for me. So it's on the one hand, it's a challenge. But the good thing is, is that both of those things are trainable. Um, one of the things I've been working with, uh, there's another friend of mine who has a, another blind guy who does martial arts. He's like a Wudong Kung Fu guy. Um, he was telling me about how he uses a wobble board. I don't know if you've ever you seen him in like physical therapy uh, mm -hmm. offices. It's like a little round kind of thing and it's flat on one side and it's round on the bottom and you're constantly engaging those little muscles. And I think just with balance, um, as with martial arts, the way you get good is by training. You know, if you don't have a lot of um, core strength, you know, past a certain level of you know, safety, of course, you know, jiu-jitsu will help you develop that core. You know, so a lot of times we think we have to be good before we start. And and so, yeah, balance and proprioception and, and some of those types of things really become a challenge, but they're trainable. And there is a certain reward that comes from doing something that I didn't think I could do. So when I first started surfing, you know, I, I struggled. I wasn't good at first. I was horrible at judo when I first started. And it goes back to do something because it's good for you, not because you're good at it. I love that. And I also love the fact that not only are you embarking on your own adventures and you're, you're becoming more active, but you, um, as I understand it, you have a nonprofit organization that you run that, to help other people have these experiences. Can you tell yeah, us a little still, bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's still kind of in process. I haven't really been promoting it too much um, because you know IRS has taken its sweet time in terms of approving it. I kind of want to get all my financial ducks in a row before I really start pushing it forward too much. Um, but I call it Adventure Mind. Uh, is you know, or Adventure Mind Inc. I guess is the the official title that I had to I had to come up with that incorporated there. But the idea is that an adventure mindset um, is uh, a valuable thing. It's something that you know life is difficult. We talked about before about doing difficult and scary things. My goal with Adventure Mind and and primarily at least initially through martial arts and through my experience you know surfing and expanding that out as we go. But the whole point behind it the whole philosophy behind it is providing the means for people to cultivate resilience primarily through adventure pursuits so whether it be marshaling martial arts surfing um you know done a little bit of stand up and some other things too so you know there might be some room as we move forward to do some performing arts things so i don't actually have a an action item for for that um you know certainly we can give like a uh, a link i have a, a link tree if you go to joshuathejedi.com slash link tree um, I'm still building the website right now, but there's a way to get in touch with me through there. You don't gain courage by only doing things that don't scare you, right? You have to do difficult things to get stronger. You have to do scary things to develop courage. And I, I, I think we're going to need that. Um, it's a weird, weird world the last three years, but absolutely nutty. Um, and people are trying to find their, their equilibrium again. And I want to be able to be a part of that. Right. And um, I'd like to just finish this off with, um, is there a question that you would like to be asked that nobody ever asks you? Will you please star in my martial arts movie and do your own stunts? We need a blind guy to play stick when we bring him back for the Marvel movies. So I'm speaking that in, into existence right now. They're going to have to bring stick eventually back to the MCU. I'm getting older. And hopefully by the time they're ready, they can have me come back and play stick. So if you're listening, Kevin Feige, um, you will be the person whose uh, question I would love to be, will you please star in a Marvel property as Stick? So that's the love question it. I want to be asked. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Um, well, hopefully we put that out there and let's see if we right can make that happen. Sweet. <laughs> so if anybody, if anybody knows him, forward, you know, forward that message to him. To, you know, we'll, we'll put Josh's <laughs> contact information on screen, but that'd be great. Right. And if anybody wants to get in touch, uh, fastest way, joshwithajedi.com slash linktree, and there's a whole bunch of different ways. Absolutely. Well, uh, Sensei, I would love to thank you so much for your time thank today. You. And um, I'd also like to thank you know, our mutual friend, William Ford, for um, for putting us in contact with each other. This was an absolute privilege. And it's actually nice to actually have this kind of conversation where we can actually get into a little bit more of the meat. Because people, you know, people think of blind martial arts or people with a disability and they have immediate assumptions. But it's worth really sitting down and taking a look at what kind of impact it has on lifestyle changes and i just love the fact and i find it incredibly inspiring that you, you did more than just accept the fact that you that you lost your vision you charged forward 
to a point like further than most people even go with their vision. So I love that. And I think that's incredibly inspiring. And I just want to thank you so much for sharing that with us today. And actually, hopefully people watching get that whole concept of, you know, I, I need to go run towards my fears. And, I, and yep. I'm hoping that this message gets out there to inspire everyone watching. And I just think it's a wonderful story. And thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Thank you. So today's conversation left a major impression on me, and I think it lays out a very, very important concept, and that is the concept of racing towards your fears and confronting them. And that applies to whether you're in the martial arts or not, or whether you have any sort of impairment or not. So I would really like to thank Joshua today for spending his time with us and giving him giving us some incredible insight and a lot to think about in just life in general. And I commend him on on his his spirit and his and his, his fight forward. And I think a lot of us can draw inspiration from that. So thank you again so much sure for coming on the show with us today you've given me a lot to think about and if you like inspirational stories especially from those individuals who use the martial arts to overcome what seem to be insurmountable odds then i highly recommend our episode and interview with ian mcleod who used the martial arts to overcome a series of traumatic brain injuries and there's a lot to learn and sometimes we can learn the most from the people who have had to face the worst <laughs>